Welcome back, Deep Review TV viewers. It's Chris Nichols here. I'm actually joined by Richard Butler from Deep Review, as well as Rishi Sanyal from Deep Review, and Jordan Drake, who's got us all together, and he's going to explain why. Jordan, why did you bring us all together here today? Yesterday, I had a shower epiphany, which is when all the best ideas happen. It occurred to me that smartphones are able to give you way better image quality than they should using computational techniques. Like you can see right here, we've got a Pixel smartphone with a super tiny sensor competing with micro four thirds image quality wise. And we haven't been able to do something quite that significant with some of the bigger sensors. And I think one of the big limitations for that is the way that the speed that the sensors can read out. But now with Sony's new a1, they've got a sensor that is reading out incredibly quickly in order to give you 30 frames per second with the electronic shutter. So what I'm wondering is, is it possible that that fast readout on the A1 sensor could give us a huge image quality bump as well as just giving us things like fast frame rates? Okay, so that makes sense. We have talked a little bit before about how other companies like Olympus have kind of featured uh, computational style techniques like their live ND kind of technology. And we've had things like Panasonic cameras doing pre-burst modes, pre-buffer modes, so you can get multiple shots and it's always buffering, select the picture that you want. I mean, these have already been useful tools for us. So what is so unique about the Sony A1 system, for example, and the technology that it's incorporating that could really change things for us? Smartphone sensors are very small and tend to read out very quickly. And a lot of them are now using the latest stacked CMOS technology. This allows you to basically glue layers of sensor together, which gives you a lot more freedom when you're designing it. And a lot of them are building RAM directly into the chip, which means you can read it out really fast and then store, you can buffer that image data in the chip, even if your processor downstream can't cope with all that data. And that's absolutely what the A1 is doing. Uh, the Sony A9s used stacked CMOS before, but the A1 uh, sensor reads out, I think it's one and a half times faster, despite having uh, 1.4 times as many rows to read out. It's achieving a shutter rate of 1 200th of a second, which is incredibly fast. And with this fast readout, it means not only can you take lots of shots more closely together, but that also means that there's very little that's changed between each image. And that gives you a really so strong foundation if you're going to then try and do clever computational stuff on top of it. Okay, so Rishi, you've had done so much work with smartphones and, and kind of the mystery of what they're doing in the back end. What kind of applications are we gonna then see as a potential on a large camera? Like, would that all make sense? As Richard mentioned, um, smartphones have been using the stacked sensor technology for some time now because they have to overcome the physical limitations of their small sensors uh, to provide better image quality. So when you open the camera app on your smartphone, um, basically what the uh, camera is doing is it's taking a whole bunch of images, taking them, throwing them away, taking them, throwing them away constantly. In, and what it's doing is it's storing those frames in a cyclical buffer. And as soon as you hit the shutter button, it uses that as a reference frame and it takes all the images that it had already taken and then um, merges them together and it does it in a tile based manner so if there's any movement from frame to frame they can just take take the small little sections and move and put them back together and align them together and what does that do it basically decreases noise increases dynamic range um, in some cases can even increase resolution and in doing so it can overcome the all those restraints of that small sensor so the alpha one um, in bringing this stacked uh, sensor technology to a full frame large sensor camera can now bring you all those benefits to this larger sensor camera. Now it's important to remember, you know, we're not saying that the Alpha One is actually doing this right now. We're just saying it, br the sensor brings a potential to do these sorts of cool things. Like, wouldn't it be cool if? Yeah, that, that does make sense, Rishi, because I think we have to bring Jordan's crazy bathroom escapades back to reality here, right? I mean, uh, it's a very expensive sensor. It's going to be a long time before we're going to really see, I think, implementations of this in an affordable manner. Let's keep that in mind, too. We're just kind of, yeah, shooting back and forth an interesting theory of what could possibly be or where the industry might be going. I think one interesting thing to think about with um, uh, the Alpha One is this whole idea of removing barriers with electronic shutters. So the Alpha One could have almost been released as uh, an electronic shutter only camera without a mechanical shutter because it's, it's removing many of the barriers to electronic shutters. So for example, it allows you to shoot uh, flash with electronic shutter because of the fast uh, e-shutter readout rate. 
And so in the future, we're probably going to see uh, cameras released without any mechanical shutter at all. And so as we see electronic shutter only cameras, we're kind of going full circle back to smartphones because that's essentially what smartphones are. And we might actually see manufacturers thinking more like smartphone camera uh, manufacturers, in which case we might see some of these applications um, that we were talking about uh, with smartphones like cyclical buffers and computational approaches. Uh, we might see camera, ma camera manufacturers doing that more and more because if you think about it, when we had mechanical shutters and mirrors and DSLRs, we couldn't even have this whole idea of cyclical buffers and buffering nine frames in me memory because your camera would be firing off like a machine gun. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen uh, manufacturers moving in this direction already. Um, we've seen some of the high-end Olympus cameras can shoot flash with electronic shutter, albeit not at nearly such a fast shutter speed. Um, and then we've seen uh, the Sigma FP, which is a camera with a full frame sensor that relies entirely on electronic shutter. And that allows the camera itself to be much, much smaller because it just doesn't have to have that mechanism in there. You know, photographers, I mean, they're terrified of all voodoo black magic that comes out. Uh, not the actual specific black magic company, although that does sometimes scare me too. Uh, but really it's, you know, like, do we want this stuff? I mean, are we gonna feel like we're losing control? I don't know, I could see arguments either way. I think it'd be great to have a lot of convenience factors like just be able to take one shot but have an amalgamation of images and the camera will decide which one was most in focus, sharpest. I mean, we've seen implementations of this on other cameras and that could just expand. I could see how it'd be very powerful to have some sort of image file or I don't get one image again, I get a collection and I can change dynamic range afterwards. I can make a lot of choices in post, perform a lot of computational magic. I mean, this would be honestly uplifting as a creative person as opposed to restricting. But this is all theory. We're not there yet. Uh, I don't know, Jordan, I guess uh, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, well, that's all I wanted to know. I just wanted to know that I'm not crazy, that this is doable. And yeah, it's not here yet, but I'm really hoping that we start seeing some of these cool tricks coming to big sensor cameras now that the technology has arrived. Uh, so thanks for joining me for this conversation, everybody. Don't forget, uh, make sure that you subscribe because by Valentine's, February 14th, if we hit 300,000 subscribers, Chris and the rest of you get to choose what terrible video camera I'm shooting four episodes on. If you wanna see that, be sure to subscribe. Don't forget to check out dpreview.com. They've got tons of information on the A1 and they just got their camera. So I bet we'll have sample galleries coming very shortly. And thank you so much for watching, everybody. We'll see you all again very soon on Deep Peer View TV.